Uh, delighted to be joined now by Cindy Yu. How are you? I wasn't invited on the press pack. Were you not? <laughs> not, not yet. Sure. Yeah, yeah. I would have been annoyed if they used that picture of, like, you know... I know, with his eyes closed. <laughs> in Jack's defence, in all the other photographs, he has got his eyes well and truly open. In fact, in one photograph, which I wish we had, uh, he's looking rather adoringly at Rishi Sunak. And I wish someone would look at me the way that Jack uh, Elson <laughs> looks at Rishi. Not like that, that's creepy. Yeah, I think Jeremy does. <laughs> no, it's not quite That's a bit same. creepy. So, t give me adoringly. How do you look adoringly? No, I'm not going to do it. Okay. Here. I don't want to waste that okay. time. <laughs> Now, you from the Spectator City, we've got so much to talk about. Um, just very briefly, this defence, 75 billion. I just raised the point with Lord Richard Danner. Mm. We had a budget three weeks ago, didn't we, Nick? Not a mention of defence spending, all about tax cuts. I said at the time, I think the British public, after COVID, are a bit more switched on and have sussed out now. You know, if you give somebody something like loans, you're gonna have to you're gonna have to have it back. So there was an appetite, I think, not for tax and for this. But this is electioneering, isn't it? Timing wise? This is electioneering. And and the reason it wasn't mentioned in the budget, I think, is because it's quite last minute, actually. Mm. It seems like Rishi Sunak's gone away during the Easter recess, come back and decided And found right, seventy five billion quid. Well, he's going to have to find that money because he's not going to borrow it, but he's going to he's floated the idea of cutting civil service instead, which is total red meat to the right of the party, uh, cutting out those inefficiencies in the bureaucracy. Um, but I think he's gone away during the Easter recess and come back and decided, right, this is the last sprint now. This is the last hurdle. I just need to get through this and it's just go completely all out. That's also why we heard about Rwanda earlier this week. Um, and I think basically heading up to the local May elections, um, but also just for the rest of this year, he's trying, at least, to really just appeal to one side of the party. Now, I understand why this might have worked had Jeremy Corbyn still been the leader of the Labour Party. Um, we know his feelings about mm. certain defence spending, etc. Keir Starmer is not that leader, though. Do you think that this actually will be sort of brought up by the British public and think that Sunak is the man to lead us if we were to get involved further than we are already in conflict? I think it depends on how Labour reacts to mm. it. And in some ways, this is quite an um, effective trap for Labour because, as you say, Corbyn would have had such serious problems with this. But Keir Starmer does not want to be seen as Corbyn. And he has already pledged 2.5% when the finances allow it. So that, he's That's have an to interesting react. word, isn't it? He's going to have to respond to this new pledge because Rishi Sunak isn't saying when the finances allow it. Rishi Sunak is saying now, or at least by I 2030, thought... we're doing this. Um, Keir Starmer is going to have to respond to that. Mm -hmm. And if he does respond to that, he's going to be tying his own government yeah. up because bear in mind, Rishi Sunak can make whatever promises now. Peter so Carble made... not going, not to, going to be, be the power. Cindy, yeah. Peter Carble made, I thought, a really important point earlier. Sunak might have come back from the holiday and thought, I've nothing to lose, this is my legacy. Yeah. Sunak could lose spectacularly and people say, yeah, but at the end, he raised some money for the exactly. military and he exactly. did that. Uh, my question is very simple. You're a political commentator. Why the hell, when that man said, I'm going to do this differently, I'm going to get rid of every, all the chaos. Why didn't he do this two years ago, mate? This could have made a difference. This smacks of desperation. That's my issue, doesn't it? Yeah, I think... Should have is... listened to the public before. <laughs> it is a little bit too late, um, too yeah. little too late, I think, because, you know, looking at the polls, nothing really looks like it's going to change that gap, even, you know, the problems that Angela Rayner has had. Well, let's get on to that in a minute. I'm looking... <laughs> reflected in the polls. Um, so, yes, I agree. But I think, you know, Jeremy, to be, to be fair to him, he has had you know, more geopolitical tension since he's become prime minister. You know, obviously Ukraine happened before he was prime minister, but the Israel-Gaza thing, China's threats on Taiwan, all of these things, I think, make the British voters think much more about defence in yeah, a way that we much. haven't done before. Let's move on to the absolute tragedy that occurred yesterday morning. Um, five people dying in the channel, including one seven-year-old girl. France has since been accused of irresponsible actions after those people died. What do you make of the fact that that happened so soon after mm. the Rwanda bill was brought in? Do you think it goes to show that actually the bill won't change anything in the minds of people smugglers? Well, I think when you speak to, well, when you read the reporting of the journalists who've spoken to the migrants who um, survived, they're still trying. Yeah. You know, they're still going to be trying. And when you talk to them about Rwanda, they seem to think, well, you know, they're never going to get me because there's such a big backlog that chances are, you know... It's not just that, come, is it? Have you not heard what we found out well. on Monday about this? You can, <laughs> only be, you can only be sent if you're in a detention centre. So all these 170,000 people, mm. a lot of whom are in our society, in our communities, and we don't know where these people are because they don't have paperwork or whatever, they have to be emailed or... I read this last night. have to be emailed mm. by somebody from the home office says, if you'd like to come to a detention centre, we'd be very pleased to put you up and then we're going to deport you. They're not going to come, are they? Right. Never heard of anything more 
Honestly, and then I find out on Monday as well, the Rwandan government have sold the accommodation we paid the millions for because they didn't think it was going to happen. Well, there's yeah. a limit on detention, isn't there? I'm, I'm, yep. I need to double-check this, but isn't it 28 days? The, I think the, it is. And yeah, then I'm, beyond I'm 28 sure days, the people can essentially mm. roam freely. So if we had a more effective system, we would be able to process genuine asylum seekers, yeah. of which we know, you know, according to the most recent data, which I accept is a few years old now, the majority of which are genuine cases, we'd be able to process people and send them where they're supposed to go. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the problem here is still the massive backlog. The fact that we've got over 100,000 Well, give me a political party that creates a processing system then, Cindy. <laughs> I mean, I'm, people laugh at me. That would have been either make agreements with countries like you've done with Albania, make it with 20 countries, or sort out a processing system. Yeah. Giving France £500 million pounds a year, spend that, the passport office might... Every day I say this, right? Three years ago, you're laughing, you can get a passport for six months, now you can get one in three days. Do that with the border controls. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think I think the pandemic was so bad for that. You know, if you look at the graphs of, of the backlog, it really rose in that, as it did in many other areas in this in the UK, right? The court system, policing, healthcare, so many waiting lists. Um, so the question is, will Rwanda really deter people who think that they can just play their odds? I mean, they have defeated so many odds already to get to Calais. So this is the final hurdle for them. And I think until the flights start getting off, we won't know. Um, but, you know, in some ways, it'd be a good way to test this theory, right? This, this Rwanda scheme has been going, been talked about for years now, since Boris Johnson first announced it. Um, and the government has always had a cover of, well, we're not allowed to do it. Now that they are allowed to do it, and flights look like they are going to be getting off the ground in the summer, mm -hmm. They won't have anything to hide behind if it doesn't actually reduce illegal immigration. I thought one day we'll actually them, go through it? a show without and talking I about And I find it's so interesting. That I think the narrative so often can be that, oh, these people are looking for an easy ride. They come over here, they pay their money, they get into the system, etc. Whatever kind of person is coming over here for whatever motivations or reasons, you cannot possibly say that it is easy mm. in order to, like you say, um, even getting to Calais in itself has its own difficulties staying there and then running the risk of dying, drowning yeah. in the channel. Uh, and then what on earth are you going to do once you arrive on UK soil? It is still difficult and that deterrent has to really be effective. And at the moment, I just can't see how Rwanda is an effective Well, now we'll give you three grand to if, go to if, Kigali. If death itself is not a deterrent, mm. I don't understand how going to Rwanda would be. Yeah. Cindy, can I just bring you to the final thing? Um, again, a bit of a bugbear of mine. De Deputy Prime Minister's question time today, uh, mm. because Rishi's away. Uh, this has all worked out rather badly. So Angela Rayner, uh, in the spotlight this afternoon against Dowden, we've got the defence thing, but here is a lady, um, and I've said publicly I, I like, I think she's a breath of fresh air. I do not understand why this lady does not release the information that will call the <laughs> hounds off. You're doing that laughing thing again. To me, they are making a... just making a rod for their own backs, but I'm convinced that certain people in the Labour Party are enjoying seeing her squirm, including the leader. Yeah, interesting. I mean, I, I haven't spoken to Labour figures about this, but it seems to me that if, if they don't want to set a precedent for releasing this kind of data. You know, no politician has to really release this kind of data. Mm -hmm. And if Angela Rayner does for arguably £5,000 or something like that, then it does set a precedent, um, not just for the Labour Party, but also for the Conservative Party and sure. all politicians, really. Well, to be fair, Greater Manchester Police are investigating mm -hmm. multiple allegations. Yeah. So if she was to release this information, wouldn't that prejudice, potentially, or affect a police investigation? Listen, I, I'm, I'm actually talking about it from an optics PR point of view. I've made sure. my point. I but think I just in a legally. world of beige, horribly boring politicians, she's all right. But if she's innocent, I don't care what anybody... T I mean, you're right now, because it's being investigated, but this could have been nailed, Cindy. This could have been nailed three months ago, and that merely fuels people's suspicions. Yeah, I just it don't does. know if it's going to really be reflected in the polls, though. And if it's not yeah. reflected in the polls, if it's not going to change then anyone's minds to not vote for Labour, then it really doesn't matter. Labour basically does not have to do anything right now. It can just coast. And do you not think there'll be a bounce from the... Do, uh, uh, not that I believe there will be, but do you think that Rishi might get a bounce from the defence spending thing? Possibly, mainly with his, within his own party. Mm. But, you know, the May elections are still coming. As so many 2019 voters are still saying that they would rather vote for a different party or not vote at all. Sure. I don't think it's enough, but, you know, I'm willing to be proved wrong once May 2nd comes. Um, but, yes, I mean, Labour essentially, strategically, doesn't have to do anything that it doesn't want to right now because that poll lead is just so great. And quickly before we finish, your comments on the very sad news that Frank Field has yeah. passed away. 
Yeah, I mean, he was such a giant of parliament over such a number of years, um, respected by his constituents as a brilliant local MP, which, by the way, not all of them <laughs> are. Oh. Um, and so he really took his job seriously. Um, and yeah, what can I say? Um, end of an era. It's interesting. We were, we were, we were leading some comments about Frank Field. He was one of those people who sort of transcended politics, didn't he? Because he cared about issues like poverty and he was taken in, he did surveys and stuff for, for conservative governments. He was a respected peer and a cross a bench, cross -bench peer. Yeah. He was just a really, just, just a good politician. In fact, here we go, I'm going to rant. I wonder how many could look at somebody as good as Frank Field, what he gave to his constituents and his country. Some of the politicians today should leave the places where they are with what are drinks and drugs and rent boys. Honestly, I'm being serious. That's a proper old school good politician, mm. isn't it? He does feel like he's from like a different time yeah. of politics, yeah. more, a less febrile time. Yeah. Well, but yeah, very well said. Uh, <laughs> I like you. that word, febrile. Thank you so much for joining Thanks, us this morning. Cindy Yu from The Spectator.